In this video, we'll introduce vectors and some of the properties that govern them. To understand what vectors are and why we care about them, let's imagine you're going for a walk. You start at your house, and then you walk 50 meters north. You turn to the right, and you walk 20 meters east. You can ask the question, how far do you end up from your house? Also, in what direction are you from your house? You'll know, given the picture, that you don't end up 70 meters. Instead, we have to do some geometry to figure out how long that blue arrow is. Vectors are a mathematical construct that let us describe things that have both a length and a direction. Up to this point in your life, you've learned all sorts of math. And you learned how to do math with things that could be represented by one number. We call those things scalars. Scalars are things like your speed, or your mass, or your shoe size, or the number of apples you ate today. All of these things are things that you could represent with one number. There are, however, things that we can't represent with one number, like your position in space, or the acceleration you're experiencing. There are lots of things in nature that will require more than one number to describe them. These are the things that we will call vectors. The arrow you see on the screen is a vector. It has magnitude and direction. And when we say magnitude, this is the length of that arrow. Now, because a vector is defined by just the magnitude and the direction, it means that it is also independent of a coordinate system. So I could choose a coordinate system like this, and the, that red arrow has a certain length and points in a certain direction. But if I changed my coordinate system, to this green primed coordinate system, you'll notice the length and direction of that arrow has not changed. Its relationship to my coordinate system has changed, but the length and the direction of the arrow has not changed. Not only that, but it means I can slide my arrow anywhere along. I can draw my arrow, arrow at the origin, or I can slide it along and draw it somewhere else. And this second arrow is the same as the first, it has the same length, has the same direction, so it's the same vector. Now, even though a vector is independent of coordinate system, we will want to be able to describe a vector in terms of the coordinate system we choose. And we will do that by using unit vectors. We need a way to indicate how much of a vector points in our x direction or our y direction or our z direction. The unit vectors will allow us to do this. Now, what is a unit vector? Well, a unit vector is just a vector that points in the direction of my x axis. There are lots of notations we can use. I will stick to the i hat notation. So in the x direction, I have i hat. In the y direction, I have j hat. If you can see the z direction, which is coming out of the screen, that would be the k hat direction. This little hat above my vector tells me it is a unit vector. Now, why do we say it's a unit vector? Well, its length is one unit. So if I looked at the magnitude of my unit vector, it would be one, whatever units I am in. So if I were drawing a vector that had units of meters, then the unit vector would be one meter. If my vector were in meters per second, then the unit vector would be one meter per second. This then allows me to write a vector, such as the A vector, in terms of the coordinate system I chose. Now the A vector has a magnitude, remember that's the length of the arrow, which we write using these vertical bars, or sometimes we will just drop the vector symbol off the top of our letter, and that denotes the magnitude of the vector.
to write the a vector in terms of my chosen coordinate system x and y, I need to find out how much of a points in the x direction and how much of a points in the y direction. We call these the vector components of the a vector. If I take a dotted line and I drop it straight down from the tip of a to the x axis, then I draw an arrow from the origin of my x axis all the way to where that dotted line touches. I get an arrow that points exactly how long a is in the x direction. This is the x component vector of my a vector. I can then write this component vector in terms of its magnitude and the x unit vector. Remember, this just says this is a vector that points in the x direction. Now, what is the length of my ax vector? Well, if I go to my trigonometry, I can see that this is a right triangle. This x component vector, this is the adjacent side of my right triangle, whereas the a vector, this is my hypotenuse. And if I go to Sokotoa, and I remember then the cosine of my angle equals adjacent over hypotenuse. When I rearrange my terms, I can get the magnitude of my ax vector in terms of the magnitude of my vector a and the angle it is making with the x axis. That will give us the x component of our vector, but we also need to know how much of our vector points in the y direction. So we can do the same thing. We take a dotted line and we draw it from the tip of A over to the y axis. We draw an arrow from our origin up to where that dotted line touches, and that arrow is then the y component of our A vector, or A sub y vector. It again has a magnitude and a direction. This j hat again just tells us this is in the y direction. To find the magnitude of a y, we can use the property that vectors are independent of their coordinate system or where they are in the coordinate system. We can slide this blue arrow along to the other side of our triangle. Now this is the opposite side of our triangle. And A still is the hypotenuse. So we look at Sokotoa, our good old trig functions, and we see that the sine of our angle is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. And when we rearrange that, we find that the magnitude of our A sub y vector, the y component vector of a, that's just the magnitude of a times the sine of my angle theta. Now, we do have to be very careful in how we're defining our angles, because if we define our angle from the x-axis, then we can use these formulas that we've come up with. But if instead we define our angles from the y-axis, say using this phi, then we actually get entirely different formulae for our components. But no matter how we define our component angles, we can always then write our original vector a as the sum of these two component vectors. And if we had a three-dimensional vector, we could just add another z component vector. Then to find the magnitude of a, well, this is a right triangle. We have the hypotenuse being a 
the length of one side being a y and the length of the other side being a x. And so we can use good old Pythagorean theorem to say a squared equals a x squared plus a y squared. When we take the square root, sure enough, we get that the magnitude, we get the magnitude of a. Now I said a was independent of our coordinate system, but one thing to be mindful of is that our components are not. Remember our components tell us how much a points in the direction of our chosen axes. So if we choose these axes shown, we would get the purple arrow and the blue arrow as you see them. But what if we picked a different axis? What if we tilted our axis and we picked this green prime axis? Well, you can immediately see the purple arrow got a lot longer and the blue arrow got a lot shorter because now A points a lot more in the X prime direction than it does in the Y prime direction. So we have to be mindful how we define our angle, how we define our coordinate axes. But as long as we are careful, we can now use vectors to describe quantities like position, like velocity, like acceleration and force, things that require a direction as well as a magnitude. In future videos, we'll talk about how we can add vectors, subtract vectors, and multiply vectors, and how their operations are very similar to scalar operations that you've learned in the past, but have some very important differences.